and um Stephen sent in a piece of music uh, this week, uh, play, uh, written by Bach, uh, which I'll put on the website. On the website, it's got a little section under for music with some of Stephen's pieces. Um, and I thought I'd just set some images of the last week to help us like reflect and think about the week that's been. So um, this is uh, this is some reflections of the things and also of our churchyard and of uh, of Alderholt. So. Sorry. <laughs> Ah, oh, yes, the snowdrops are coming. The snowdrops are coming. Um, now, going to try and have the reading from Angela. So, uh, Angela, let's uh, let's see if uh, see if your internet works. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. Let's try. It usually does. If it's just me trying to talk. So, um, today's reading is from John's Gospel. Chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He was revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And thank you, Angela, that worked perfectly. Just shows, doesn't it? <laughs> So, um, yes, so Epiphany, okay, like I said, this brief thing that happens just after Christmas is to do with three events that show who Jesus is, okay? So the coming of the wise men and his baptism and the turning of water into wine at Cana. So these are the three events show us, and it's also the week of Christian unity this week. So there you go, lots of things. And um, 
we've been doing this Bible study thing on a Wednesday night. And it's quite interesting because people have a very um, suspicious view of the Old Testament, I think. And so some people are like, oh, I don't really I don't really want to read the Old Testament. It doesn't tell. I want to know about Jesus. I want to know. But this is exactly one of those stories, the turning of water into wine, where the Old Testament makes most sense of it. Without the Old Testament, you read this story and what do you get? Jesus did some kind of party trick, a bit like Paul Daniels, you know, and turned water into wine. Jesus has power. Uh, Jesus is not a party pooper. He likes a party because he made all this wine. Um, and Jesus can turn the ordinary into extraordinary. Yeah, maybe. Maybe we could be transformed like the water into wine. Yeah, maybe. You can get all of that. But there's a whole lot more if you start opening the doors or the windows into the Old Testament. So let me let me try and unpack a bit. This wedding starts on the third day. OK, a wedding took place. You just read that you go on the third day. The third day is like a hugely important thing on the th in the Old Testament. On the third day, it's the day uh, that uh, God shows his presence on the mountain in Exodus. It's the day they cross the River Jordan into the promised land. Um, they on the third day they crossed the Jordan. Uh, it's the day that Abraham and Isaac, when he's going to offer him on the mountain, on the third day they arrived at the mountain. Uh, the third day is the day that the temple is completed in Ezra. The third day is the day in Hosea where it says, after two days I will revive you. On the third day you will live in my presence. There are 50 references or more than in the Old Testament to things that happen on the third day. It's not just by accident that Jesus rises on the third day. The third day is the day of finishing, the day of accomplishing, the day of fulfillment. You start something on the first day. That's the day of new starts and new beginnings. The second day is when all the hard work happens. And the third day is the day of fulfillment. So this is happening on the third day, this wedding. So I wonder what's going to be fulfilled or accomplished. That's the question you should have. So. The Jewish faith uh, has a kind of system about how to keep right with God. We all know this, that there's kind of all these rules they've got that you have to keep in order to keep pure and clean. And if you do that, you can be in right relationship with God. And if you break one of their laws and you sin, then it's bad. Actually, uh, that's slightly oversimplifying the picture. The Jewish faith is much more sophisticated than that. Um, after all, God promises a one-sided covenant, a one-sided promise with him that he would always be their God, no matter what they did. So he knows that they're going to sin and it's not a problem. Um, and these rules and these laws, they're not there to make sure that people don't sin. They're there to remind them about God, not as a kind of a test to see if they're good enough. But that's the trouble with so many religions, isn't it? They kind of start off with something good and then over time, people make the rules a bit more important uh, than the relationship. And people start to use things for power and money. And that certainly is sinful. Um, and the truth about God or whatever just kind of gets lost on the way. So um, back to these uh, stone jars, right? Yeah. So these stone jars, um, they were there for all the holy washing that was going to be needed so that people could be cleansed, to be ready to be in God's presence. And you're going to need a lot of washing because you get a lot of water because there's going to be a lot of washing, isn't there? Because you'll never be clean or good enough or not for very long anyway. So at this wedding on the third day, it's the final chapter of all this old way of doing things, of the temple system, of the sacrifices and the animals. And the whole load of religious leaders restricting access to God, to those who were pure, who were Jewish, who were male, who didn't have any blemishes. Um, you know, you have to remember, this is the Jewish temple court, OK? And um, outside, OK, if so Gentiles can come so far, non-Jews, and then Jews can go a bit further. The women can go a bit further, but only the men can go there and only the priests can go there and only the high priest on one day can go there. It's all about restricting access and being exclusive 
and who uh, and not including trying to push people out and saying only you're allowed you're only you're good enough so uh jesus takes this water and he says you won't be needing this anymore we're not going to do that anymore we're not going to do all that temple system anymore i'm not going to have it the party has started 120 gallons of wine 120 gallons of wine more than enough for any party um and the wine steward is fuming uh you know you have to understand he's really angry when the wine steward says everyone saves the you know does the good wine first why have you been saving this best wine he's so cross because it looks bad on him it's a bit like if mike gets to the end of recreate and we're just taking the tent down and and someone comes up and goes oh by the way i booked kylie minogue and paul mccartney and they're in a van and he's like and why now everyone's gone you should have got them first and and i wonder if you ever thought what happened in this village on the fourth or fifth day or the next week because the thing is this village has got no more water for washing with yeah <laughs> like you know after this wedding someone thought oh no i've slipped up again i've walked my cow too far on a sabbath i better go and wash myself before i meet god and they go up to the stone jars and they go ah oh, it's wine i can't wash in that and then the penny drops and they go oh i don't need to wash anymore jesus has finished that he's fulfilled that And I think people respond different ways to that kind of thing. Because I think some people would be quite sad because they quite liked all the washing and all the rituals and the rules. And they liked knowing where they were. And they quite liked knowing where other people were, too, like those rotten Samaritans down the road who never do the washing. And some would be like, nah, well, so what? One less thing to do. No washing. Uh, I didn't really care much anyway about all this religion stuff, so it doesn't matter. And only a few would be like, oh, wow, what does that mean? That God likes me as I am, that I don't have to, uh, that I can meet him anywhere or I can talk to him anytime. Oh, is that a bit frightening or am I OK with that? And only a tiny, tiny handful will go. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Amazing. You've set me free because of you. I can be just friends with God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And usually the ones who are most thankful at the ending of the temple system are the ones most excluded by it. The poor, the women, those with defects and blemishes, those who the authorities call sinful. So what's going on in this turning wine, water into wine is that John is telling us who Jesus is. Jesus is the next thing. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets. It used to be this system for getting in touch with God and that's no more. You can get in touch with God directly in Jesus. Jesus is God. That's why it's a sign. <laughs> And only God has the authority to overturn the whole temple system and replace it with something else. So only God can be doing this. And he tears down the walls that separate poor humanity, who put the walls up in the first place, from our loving God. And you know, the temple was the place where people used to meet God, and now anyone can brush up against God. And think of the people that brushed up against Jesus, you know, the prostitutes and the beggars, and they're just coming close and Jesus doesn't mind. He's not pushing them away or restricting them. He's inclusive. So this uh, wedding at Cana is about a revolution that God is for everyone all the time. Uh, so why am I going to finish with a little note of warning? Because <laughs> I said at the beginning that religions often start off good, don't they? and then lose their way and make rules and they just start deciding who's in and who's out and money and power and control take over. I'm afraid that this party that Jesus started, I'm afraid the church has pretty much tried to ban it again and again. I'll jump forward from the first few hundreds of years of that to, to when John Wesley was, was preaching 
and was a good Church of England person, John Wesley, you know, and he was what he was trying to do was get the drunks and the down and outs into church. So he'd reserve a pew from them in the front row and things like that. And um, do you know what the Church of England said? Oh, no, we don't want them in here. Get them out. They don't belong with us. So John Wesley went out with them and found, form, formed Methodism. So, you know, there was no room for the new wine in the old wineskins, was there? And uh, our loss is Methodism's gain. It is, after all, the week of Christian unity, so. Oh, and we go a little bit further and the Salvation Army were there, you know, and they said, let's praise him on the trumpet and the timbrel and, and tell others about him. And you know what the Church of England said? The Church said, thou shalt only play the organ and only worship in seriousness and solemnitude. It's a direct quote. And the new wine burst the old wineskins and the Salvation Army played and marched in the street and people threw stones at them, including vicars and Church of England people. Oh dear. Oh, and then a little bit later, the Holy Spirit came along in the 1970s. Holy Spirit had been there all the time, but uh, the Holy Spirit started moving in a new way. And, uh, and, and some people said, that's not right. You know, stop speaking in tongues and, and stop these relentless soft rock, endless choruses, all with your emotions. And others said, no, this is the spirit of Jesus setting people free. It seems like the temptation to become Pharisees, to corner the market and who can know God or to set rules about who can come to church or how we worship or what's right and wrong belief or to make hoops for people to jump through before we accept them. There's always that temptation and the antidote is to keep coming back to Jesus. Because Jesus is the way and the truth and the truth will set you free and only Jesus is the way of reaching God. So we have to keep coming back to Jesus to set us free again. The wedding at Cana just shows us that Jesus does have miraculous power, but that power wasn't didn't die 2000 years ago because Jesus didn't die. He came back to life and then he sent his Holy Spirit to be with us. So we have access to that power here and now. And Jesus is for a party. He is for fun and all those things, but it's just far more than wine. It's the celebration of realising that we can be friends with God. We can have a real living relationship with the God of the whole universe. And Jesus doesn't say, oh, wait till you die and you can get into heaven. It'll be fine. Jesus says right here and now in the midst of this pandemic, you can enjoy eternal life. It starts now. You can experience the peace and joy and love of knowing God. And that is a promise for you and for me and for everyone. It's the third day. There's a wedding. There's a feast.